you're listening to episode 169 of the Tennis Files podcast on how to add more power to your tennis strokes. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is Mir Bonaranchad and I'm back with another episode for you. And most of the time I do interview a lot of really great coaches, pros, and experts to help you improve your tennis game. But today is a bit of a different episode. It's going to be a solo one and a bit shorter than normal because I can't get really in depth with, with my interviews and go like over an hour and a half and all that. But today is on the topic of adding more power to your tennis strokes. And I watch a lot of players obviously and play against them. And I notice that there's a lot that can be changed to achieve a lot more power than they currently are getting on their strokes. And I mean, you know, with power comes more speed on the ball, uh, heavier ball, you know, you can hit with more top spin and, and even slice. And so I think this is a very important topic. And, uh, you know, a lot of tennis players, even professionals, are constantly in search of more power. And if you think about it, the extra miles per hour or the extra heaviness of the ball that you can generate from using your body efficiently can make the difference between being on the offense during a point and playing on the defensive. And for instance, you know, you can have a point where, you know, you hit the ball 10 miles per hour faster and your opponent is going to cough up a short ball versus you hitting that ball with uh, you know a slower speed than your opponent is accustomed to handling, and then now they're the one that's going to be able to pummel that ball, and then you're going to cough up the short ball if you're even going to be able to get to it. So, but you know, unfortunately, most amateur tennis players don't use their bodies efficiently and maximize the true power that we all have, and it's obviously a great feeling to unlock more of that power. So we don't want you to leave more MPHs, uh, miles per hour, and heaviness of the ball on the table. So this episode will help you add a lot more power to your strokes and applies to pretty much all of them, uh, including your forehand, backhand, slice serves, and overheads. But I think um, the context of how I explain the technique, uh, how I'm thinking about it at least, applies to the, the forehand or the backhand. Pretty much I'm thinking about the forehand when I, when I go through this with you. But uh, again, the, the concept applies. So... In talking with, I mean, I've interviewed hundreds at this point, you know, 169 podcasts with, with mostly interviews and then my four tennis summits over the years. So that's, that's a ton. But uh, the number one reason for us not getting as much power as we'd like to on our tennis shots or strokes is not using our hips effectively in the technique. So, of course, there's a technical issue. And within that, not using our hips is the biggest reason why we don't have enough power on our strokes. And we have to change how we rotate our bodies, which uh, is described often as the unit turn, when loading on our ground strokes. And we need to incorporate our hips and lead with them. And most tennis players start the stroke, uh, their strokes with their arms because they think, well, I can hit the ball or I do hit the ball with my arms. So that's what I need to be moving. So if you look at 3-0 to 4-0 players and obviously below that, um, their very first move, uh, you know, once they're, they get to the ready position and they split step, hopefully, which that's another problem. A lot of players don't split step enough. Then they're moving their arm first. So think of the forehand. They've uh, got their right hand on the racket. And before they move any other part of their body, they're moving their arm. But this neglects our largest muscle groups in our lower body, and it also starts off way too far ahead in their kinetic chain. So what you need to do is you need to let your hips lead your body's rotation during the loading phase of your stroke. So when you're uh, you know, facing forward, before you move anything else, you want to move, uh, you need to rotate your hips and then load your weight mainly on your back leg. So I'll just repeat it again. Before you move your arms or anything else, you, you rotate your hips, and then you load your weight on your back leg. And when you do this, uh, as long as you have enough uh, mobility, your back will ideally be facing the front of the court in the loading position. So if I looked at you, say I was playing you, and you set up for your forehand and you were loaded, I would actually be able to see 
um, the back of your shirt. And that's that's a good indicator of you loading properly. And then once you uncoil your body from the loading position, then again, your hips need to lead first. And I noticed this as a problem in uh, my backhand where, uh, you know, I I noticed on both ends, I was arming too much, um, you know, leading with my arms on my backhand, uh, among a host of other issues. But so then I I got used to loading uh, with my hips first, uh, letting them lead. But then when I uncoiled, I also saw through some slow-mo video, which I highly encourage you all to do is to record yourself and then slow it down and watch is that I would uh, start to lead that uncoiling of my body, of really just uncoiling my arms, and then my hips would be lagging. But that's the opposite that you want to do. And I can tell you from experience, you know, and whenever I focus on using my hips throughout the loading and unloading phases, then I feel a lot more power. I'm hitting the ball way more solidly than I would have if I had used my old technique of uh, just using all arms. So once you are loaded uh, and then when you begin to uncoil your body, like I said, your hips again lead first and then you want to transfer your weight forward from your back leg. So you've got all this stored energy and then now you're releasing it in the proper chain, if you will, a kinetic chain uh, by transferring that weight, uh, leading with the hips and then striking the ball. And, you know, a really important point too, which I'll talk about a little later as well, is that your body needs to be loose for this to uh, to truly generate the maximum power. And your wrist will be li- laid back um, until right before impact. So a really helpful phrase that I use to help me rotate and load properly is the phrase load and explode. So whenever I feel like I'm not getting enough uh, I have miles per hour on my shots or I'm holding back. I, I think of this phrase and it really helps me mainly to think about how much I need to load my back leg and then how I need to transfer that weight, that weight uh, forward and explode into the shot. So following this technique uh, of using your hips to lead um, both the, unco- uh, the coiling and uncoiling uh, really utilizes your kinetic chain, which in other words, it uses each part of your body in the proper sequence to produce maximum power. So it all starts from the ground up. And that is what you need to do to have the proper technique. Um, and, and, you know, in learning of all these, uh, of this great concept, um, I've talked to, as I mentioned, so many amazing professionals, coaches, and pros. And if you want to learn the top secrets from over 30 world-class pros and coaches uh, on technique, strategy, fitness, and the mental game, including how to maximize your power, then just go to tennisfiles.com slash playbook. Uh, that's tennisfiles.com slash playbook, and you'll learn the top secrets from experts like James Blake, Paul Anacone, Nick Volateri, Michael Russell, Taylor Dent, Rick Macy, Dr. Mark Kovacs, and, and a ton more. So, And you can also check out that awesome resource in the show notes page. But now that we have this technique in play, which I just described, which, you know, obviously feel free to hit the rewind button and, uh, and listen to it a few more times, then we still want to examine uh, these, these power leak mistakes, I like to call them. Um, you know, they're leaks where if you fix them, then you will gain more power, obviously. So And I believe these are five of my top power leak mistakes. And the first one is not getting in position with proper footwork and being balanced. So that's kind of almost two, but you really need to have your feet in position and you need your body to be balanced. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to use your body efficiently and load maximally. Um, So think of, you know, if you're out of position and you've got to lean forward to lunge at a ball or you're leaning backwards or you're leaning to one side, then you're obviously not going to be able to load your body properly as we just described. And also you can't be too close or too far away from the ball. Your spacing has to be the right distance from the ball. So I notice that when I'm jammed or when I have to really 
reach very far out. Um, but I think even more so when I'm jammed, I, I just cannot produce the same amount of power that I would if I had the proper spacing. And speaking of footwork, when I'm not playing well, or if I start to feel nervous and I increase my footwork intensity as much as I can, I can think back to several matches, many matches where I've had, for whatever reason, the nerves creep in. And so I just try to move my feet as fast as I can. And that really helps me hit better shots and obviously more powerful ones and more accurate ones as well. So it's really important to to improve your footwork and to get in position and to be balanced and really, again, kind of examine how how that's going for you. Because I, I have found, you know, in many instances where, you know, I, I review the video and I, I see that I'm leaning back a lot and I'm just not in the right position. And that is very preventative of you getting enough power. So that's a big power leak is not getting in position with the proper footwork and being balanced. And obviously, there's certain situations where you can't prevent it or you're incapable of doing so but as much as you can you need to uh need to improve your footwork so that you can get in the best position you can to strike the ball with maximum power the second power leak mistake here i guess leak and mistake are um you know both the same essentially but um i digress the second one is that you're not mobile or flexible enough to rotate your hips enough to load. And I think it is a mistake. I think some people may argue that, you know, this is just how it is, but I think that all of us can, you know, seek some sort of solution. Uh, And I used to have issues with my hip mobility and we can't just chalk this up to old age or whatnot. And what I did is I fixed it or I improved it a lot through stretching foam rolling, yoga, and Theragun as well, which I think is renamed Therabody, but it's basically a tool to provide myofacial release, um, which you can check out at tennisfiles.com slash Theragun. Um, but that device uh, is, is really great. It really helps um, you know restore a good amount of mobility and blood flow. But uh, you know, doing all these things, I mean, especially stretching, I stretch just about every single day. And relatedly, I always perform a dynamic warm up before I play, which primes my body to function optimally on the court. So I didn't, I, I used to not do any of this, which is really not good. And I, I felt the repercussions, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I lifted weights without doing any stretching, I hit and then not stretch afterward. I didn't perform a dynamic warm up before my matches. And, you know, uh, I would feel tight for many days. And if I got very tight to the point where uh, eventually it was very painful to move around the court and, you know, even move in everyday life. Uh, and it hurt my game for sure because I just wasn't able to get into the proper position and I didn't, wasn't able to move laterally well enough. And I wasn't able to, to load properly on my shots, especially my backhand, uh, because it was actually my left hip that was the bigger issue. And so you really need to dedicate a significant amount of time in your training to stretching and mobility and these uh, these sorts of things that help you recover. Uh, Yeah, I remember one time where after USCA league match in JTCC, I I parked, um, you know, in the garage of, of my apartment at the time and uh, I, I got out of the car and I I was pretty much limping after the match. I could barely move. And, uh, you know, that was a big sign that, you know what, I need to dedicate more time to to my stretching and mobility. And I remember, I'm trying to remember if it was Mike Boyle. Uh, it might have been Mike Boyle, who I interviewed on the podcast, which I'll have a link in the show notes and, you know, below this episode where you're listening, most likely. But uh, I think he said that after age 30 or so, you, you need to add 1% to your age, or sorry, the, your age is basically the percentage of time you need to dedicate to mobility training. So that's really, I th- I've found that that's really helpful. And, um, you know, it feels so much better to be able to move around more freely than just being restricted and tight. So I know I, that I spent a good amount of time on, on this one, but, um, not being mobile or flexible enough to rotate your hips enough to load properly 
and to even get to the proper position is a really big power leak and it's uh you know it doesn't go away in a day uh, unless you have some magical chiropractor, I guess you, you just, or PT person, but you need to just dedicate, you know, even like 10 minutes a day to stretching. Uh, I have, uh, at least one full, you know, one of my days where I work out every single day in the morning and my Sunday mornings are dedicated to a full stretch routine. And then I also like to stretch most evenings. It's kind of a nice cool down uh, before I sleep. And to try to get away from these dang uh, electronic screens that are just providing you with a lot of dopamine hits and and getting you addicted to staying on there for for a long time. So uh, that's a big one. But now we'll transition to, well, actually, before we transition, I do have a free stretching workout plan as well. So uh, very similar to the one I just mentioned that I do uh, in the evenings. And you can check that out at tennisfiles.com slash stretch. That's a free stretch routine. And I also have a, a stretching routine YouTube video at tennisfiles.com slash YouTube. But now power leak mistake number three is you're not hitting through the ball. So if, you know, some players that have an excessive low to high swing path or they hit with an excessive amount of topspin and naturally this will decrease the speed on the ball. Uh, it certainly is okay to hit with heavy topspin. A lot of great players do that. Uh, I myself, you know, one of the things I'm, no- I'm known for is a, a very heavy topspin forehand. So, uh, I, you know, it's just kind of a warning that if you are swinging excessively um, low to high, then you're not going to have that, that power and, you know, that's something that I think, you know, you may not realize that you're doing, that you can change to, you know, hit uh, out more on the ball. And one really good way to improve this uh, and to make yourself hit through the ball is to actually pretend that you have to hit through three balls. And I believe I got this tip from Coach Faisal Hassan. Um, and, and yeah, so, you know, when the ball is coming at you, you pretend that you've got to hit three of them, and that will make you hit through the ball uh, more. Yeah, more. <laughs> um, so that's a really good one there. So you've got to hit through the ball in order to get that that uh, speed and power on there. Um, power leak mistake number four is you're not watching the ball before contact. And I found that this was a problem with myself as well. At one point, I was shanking quite a few balls especially with uh, me hitting a lot of topspin, you know, you, you are at a high, little bit of a higher chance of, of uh, framing the ball. And so, or you won't be able to hit it uh, solidly on contact. Yeah, so you basically have to really keep your focus on that ball as long as you can um, when it's coming at you. Otherwise, you, you, you know, you'll have this shankathon issue or you, uh, you might pull off too quickly and that obviously hurts your ability to hit the ball. It, you know, again, in, in self-analyzing my game, I found that on my backhand, I just, for whatever reason, also was not watching the ball as long as on my forehand. And when I did concentrate on watching the ball and I integrated the, uh, the concept of letting the hips lead, as I did, talked about a few minutes ago, and also uh, making sure to have a full follow-through on my backhand, these things have all really helped my shots, uh, my backhand in particular, quite a bit. Uh, if you have this problem like I did, then you, you, you want to remind yourself to lock in your eyes and your focus on the ball as long as you can. Uh, this is also big for this serve as well. Uh, all your strokes, for sure. Uh, power leak number five is that your body and your arms in particular are too tight and you just simply will not be able to get maximum acceleration and whip your arm uh, if you're too tight. So if you have this problem, I recommend that you take a deep, uh, a few deep breaths to relax your body. And also another cool thing to do is to kind of just uh, change around your grip, your grip tightness to, let's say, you have 10 levels and you grip it really tight, um, you know, maximally tight as a 10 and then like super loose as a one and then kind of find that range so that you kind of know uh, the feeling of, of 
of the highs and lows, the top and bottom of the range, and then you can adjust to, uh, to, to make it a little bit looser and you're more aware of where you are in your range. But yeah, it's, it's really important. And uh, when I was hitting on the ball machine the other day, I noticed that when my forehand, I, my body is super loose and you know I can get a lot of power on it. And then on my backhand, it's not quite as powerful. And one of those other things that, you know, that I had an issue with on the backhand is that my arms were just simply too tight. So by loosening my arms and focusing on, on just, you know, using my entire kinetic chain, I, I got a lot more effortless power. So making sure that your body is not too tight and, and just trying to relax it a bit will help a lot with producing more power on your strokes. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed and really learned from uh, this episode today. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Tennis Files podcast. I would really, really, really appreciate it. It would help my podcast a lot if you subscribe, and it would also help you a lot because uh, you wouldn't have to keep searching for these episodes as they would immediately be downloaded to your podcast app of choices as uh, soon as I upload the episode. In a lot of cases, within a few minutes, it'll be downloaded to to your uh, podcast app, which is great. And it would help out the podcast as well. So thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it'll help more people see it because it would, you know, go higher in the uh, the tennis podcast list, I suppose. So it would be great. Um, and also, you know, I mentioned the uh, the free ebook with the uh, where you can learn the top secrets from uh, over thirty world class pros and coaches like James Blake, Polanico, Nick Balteri, etc. Uh, if you go to tennisfiles.com slash playbook. And another related uh, event. It just depends when you're listening to this. But if you're listening to this on the week of October nineteenth. Um, so especially, I guess this would be published on the 21st of October, then you can check out tennis con four, which is hosted by my very good friend, Peter Freeman from crunch time coaching. And this event, uh, is, is all week and it features a lot of amazing, uh, uh, amazing coaches. I think over 40 of them, and you can actually get a free pass to watch uh, all of the sessions for free, at least the ones that haven't been up for more than 48 hours yet um, at you can go to tennis uh, tennisfiles.com slash tenniscon4 that's um, t-e-n-n-i-s-f-i-l-e-s dot com slash t-e-n-n-i-s-c-o-n-4 and if you want lifetime access to tenniscon4 or you know if you want to listen or if you want to watch all of the amazing sessions you know, well past the actual week of the event, then you can go to tennisfiles.com slash tennisconfor 4 aap So it's the same link as the previous one with just AAP. Um, but in any case, I'm going to be featured in that event uh, teaching you how to hit offensive topspin lobs. So obviously, you know, it really, it does depend when you listen to this episode, but if you listen to it, you know, on the week of October 19th, then you can check out this cool, really cool event. Yeah, and uh, all the links that I mentioned today will be in the show notes page. And uh, I also just want to leave you with a quote, as I often love to do at the end of the show. And this is a cool one by Pablo Picasso, the great artist. And Pablo said, everything you can imagine is real. Pretty cool one. Alrighty then. Well, that is all for this episode and I hope that you're able to safely play tennis and I've been really enjoying playing tennis on my slinger bag, uh, which you can check out at tennisfiles.com slash slinger bag. And uh, yeah, it's a great portable ball machine and I'm able to practice my ground strokes and obviously hit some nice serves. <laughs> well, I try my best to hit nice serves and uh, really it makes me happy to be able to to be able to play tennis and hit some balls again. So, all right. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Have a great week, a month, a great year, all that. And thanks for listening and keep improving your tennis game. Keep improving yourself at least 1% every single day and you're going to see huge dividends. Thanks so much for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files Podcast.
podcast. This is Mirabon signing out. Take care. 